Good morning, everyone. So, 50 years ago, as you know, um, CNPS was founded, and one of its main um, priorities was to preserve and protect California's native flora. And three years after the foundation of CNPS, Dr. G. Ledger Sevens took that a step further and started um, cataloging rare plants based on a distance of 100 miles. And the distance was, <laughs> sorry, I'm trying to remove some feedback here. Um, this distance was used from Munn's California flora, and it was a good start um, to catalog the rare plants. So this original attempt uh, is what was done is Ledger would, would do handwritten notes on three by five cards, and a lot of these would also have uh, photos of the plant on the back side or variant labels that have been scanned in. And it got up to be about uh, 520 uh, taxa that were on these cards um, that are filled in probably 40 boxes. So car there's each species has multiple cards. And just a little history of the, the program and the inventory. Um, in 1971, so that, that list was up to 520. And by the time the first edition of the inventory came out, it was already uh, nearly triple at 1393. And in 1980, there was a second edition. And in 1982 was a, a momentous occasion where the state um, Department of Fish and Wildlife and uh, the California Native Plant Society drafted an MOU and were co-located with staff and started continuously um, updating the data together and sharing information across the board. And that relationship still uh, occurs today. In the 1990s, um, there was additional print editions coming out and the Scientific Advisory Committee was in effect. And this was a committee uh, of the program where there was basically a big in-person meetings held uh, at least annually, if not more, and they do powwows and and uh, actually rank species within, um, within these meetings. And then in 2000s, it switched on to an online review process, which is what I'm going to talk a little more about today. So a couple of the cruxes of the inventory, um, it helps prevent plants from becoming listed um, by allowing people to uh, prioritize and aid in the protection before that uh, a listing uh, would occur. And at the same time, um, it prioritizes plants that should be listed. So why should we conserve our species? I want to thank Russell for an excellent talk this morning and to help uh, outline that. And um, I basically feel the same way. Uh, Michael Soleil, who I hope you were able to see for our uh, plenary address on uh, Thursday, um, outlines four core principles of uh, biological diversity and um, or biological conservation. And diversity of organisms, ecological complexity, functional evolutionary processes, um, but the fourth is that biodiversity has intrinsic value uh, irrespective of its usefulness to humans. And so this is my um, opinion as well as um, kind of the crux of it essentially is they have intrinsic value irrespective of their medicinal uses of you know, just getting those genes. So California, uh, this is the uh, California has a high rate of um, diversity. This is a rarity weighted uh, richness index. And it, it, actually, California encompasses 25% uh, of all native plants in the nation. Um, and of the, uh, within California, we have 6,500 native plants. And a third of uh, our flora is considered rare, threatened, and endangered, including the inventory. So we currently have 2,334 rare plants in the inventory and that number fluctuates. Um, and so this is a huge percent, that 35% of the, the native flora is considered rare. And a lot of us know why that is. Um, there's a, a natural um, topographic uh, soils, uh, Mediterranean climate, and very diverse state that we're all in. So there's a lot of natural diversity. And there's also um, anthropogenic rarity for rare plants. So we have a high number of um, plants that are rare naturally. They're occurring on the peaks of um, 
uh, really high elevations and in really remote areas and stuck to really um, rare soils and edaphic endemism. But we also have a high number of rare plants because of um, human interactions. And so this is an uh, outline of the CMPS inventory over time. Um, the inventory years when they were printed are on the bottom, and uh, 2014 was, um, it's, the last one is from 2001 to 2014. That marks the, the switch from going to an online version. And as you can see, it's uh, increased over time, and this is uh, partly due because we've had more um, available information and online resources to utilize, such as the Consortium of California Herbaria. Um, and it's also because we have more uh, people looking at um, rare plants and helping with the, the process and no longer having these in-person meetings with um, just a few uh, people present. So the, the process has helped uh, change that. And so now on to the actual process itself. Um, the, first, the first step is identifying a potential change. And so this often comes from people that uh, request a change. It's hard to uh, keep an eye on all 2,300 plants and know which ones may be uh, threatened from uh, development projects and things. And it really, it's really helpful for people to let me know, hey, this plant is on list four, uh, which is our watch list, but you know maybe it should be bumped up to 1B because there's been a lot of um, habitat destruction that we weren't aware of when we first uh, listed the plant in the inventory. And then there's also a lot of changes that come through scientific literature and forestry treatments, such as the second edition of the Jepson Manual, where we have a lot of taxonomic name changes and um, plants being lumped into, uh, into more uh, broader uh, genera or, or species, and um, the opposite, where, where things are getting split out and treated as varieties or subspecies or something that's once common. So after that, we develop information. So this is where we get heavy into the research. And we rely on uh, a lot of personal communications with people and a lot of online resources and our extensive library that we keep growing of, of floristic treatments. And some of the key factors that we assess um, are rarity. Um, so one of the first things we do is we look at the total number of element occurrences and I'm going to switch over to a little uh, definition of what that is. So an element is a, a plant, animal, or natural community of, of track that's tracked by the Heritage Program, which would be the California Natural Diversity Database in our case. And the occurrence is the specific location or locations where those elements are known to occur. So this is WF block manii, subspecies block manii, and I don't know if you can see the little um, yellow outlines, but there's some of its populations. Um, those are considered element occurrences. And the definition of an element occurrence in California is a population or group of populations that are separated by a quarter of a mile. So here we have a um, Tal Talisicius stibinzii, and we're just looking at sample populations. Um, let's consider the first population of uh, multiple individuals and the second population of a uh, single individual. And if they have a distance of a quarter of a mile apart, they'd be considered um, two separate element occurrences. And so it's important to realize also that California is different than other states as far as what the definitions of element occurrences are. The nationwide standard is actually a kilometer distance. And so I'm gonna take you on this little uh, scenario that would, is not, never going to happen in nature really, but um, pretend that you have these, uh, this, um, these red marks are rare plant populations, and so then again they could be any number of an individual to thousands of individuals, and consider um, our adjacent state Nevada has the same plant that has the same exact distribution uh, but in Nevada, and so when we add our um, element occurrence definitions for California, we're going to use a quarter mile, and in Nevada they would use a kilometer in their natural heritage program. And so, if in this in this uh, specific scenario, you would have four separate element occurrences in California versus only a, a single element occurrence in Nevada. So you can think about the um, implications of um, how our plants are mapped and the, the amount of rare plants we have um, based on this difference. So. 
So um, after we assess rarity or during, during the uh, assessment of rarity, we'll also look for trends, um, short and long-term trends of the element occurrences. Are they increasing or decreasing? And how fast? Um, we also look at the scope of and severity of threats. And then also, also uh, taxonomic status. Um, and a lot of this, it comes down to, uh, to herding cats, folks. <laughs> And a lot of this information is not uh, readily available, as you know. Um, people will discover a new species, and then we have no, uh, hardly any historical literature, except maybe that it was collected in, you know, the late 1800s as something and identified as something else. Um, and so we really need the on-the-ground experience uh, for people, and um, that can often have uh, people often have differencing of opinions of whether it's a real taxon or not, and uh, so it, it does get complicated. It's not as simple as it sounds. Um, once we uh, identify, we identify a potential change, um, the proposed change after we review. So someone might recommend something for addition to our 1B uh, category, which is our most imperiled uh, rare in California and uh, elsewhere. And after we review the data and contact all the people and get all the information we can, we might find that that, well, it's kind of too common for that status. So we should really, it's more on the borderline or possibly a rank four watch list. Or it could go the other way around, where someone actually recommends a four, but we find that it's um, it should actually be a one B. So we actually ch can change the potential uh, or change the proposal of what uh, someone proposed. And we and I draft all these documents. We have um, two to four pages of summary of all the information, and after that, we actually uh, post it onto a rare plant forum for people to comment on and we uh, send it out to regional plant status review groups. And so these are email groups, and I'm gonna go over those a little more. Um, so basically took the Jepson um, manual regions and split them up into seven um, more broader categories and made these broader seven categories into email groups. And so there's over 400 members that are within these email groups assigned to one to multiple um, regions. And so the hope is that people from their region will, will be able to um, you know, have more expertise of uh, plants in their region and be able to comment specifically on the plants that are under review. So a contributor to the process are from a, a variety of affiliations. And um, as you can see, there's a pretty big other and unknown category. And a lot of that is probably to be split out into these uh, known categories we're just not sure. Um, but a big, uh, big part of it as well is a lot of um, non-professional botanists that are, that are really uh, knowledgeable that have been on the ground and going in their backyards and going all over the state um, and looking and photographing and uh, learning about our rare plants. So the diversity of qualified reviewers ensures that the final determinations are well vetted. And this process I could go on and on because it we have a, a review period where it goes out for a couple weeks and comes back and then we reanalyze and send it out again. Um, so I just wanted to mention that there's a poster uh, that you guys may have seen already that, that outlines the process more on the right side of the poster and I'm not gonna go through every single step of this. <laughs> but if you want more information, you can go check that out or contact me. And so I wanted to say thanks and uh, leave you with this slide that I'm going to add to after talking with Russell. <laughs> there's, there's actually one last thing I want to say. Um, I put up here on the table where the uh, projector is, there's a stack of status review reviewer forms, and I encourage anyone that's interested, um, that wants to be updated on what's going on and what's changing in the inventory, and potentially uh, provide comments or information to uh, grab one of those and check it out. And um, we just ask for uh, you to fill out two sections of it, basically your, your information and some of your botanical experience. And then you can be signed up to receive emails um, in whatever review group you want. And um, it's a great way to, to get involved. And we also, even if you don't know about the species, um, it's word of mouth that we really you know, get to know who's, who's doing the research on that we may have not known. So. Thank you, sir. There, there is time for questions. Um, with the criteria for elemental occurrences in California being a quarter mile uh, distance in other states a kilometer, has there been a discussion about potentially changing that? It seems 
if we're under it compared to other states where we're overestimating the number of occurrences, and if the number of occurrences is a trigger for a status change, then that's something that there could be a discussion on. Yeah, I think it's it's never been considered. I think in the in um, the nineteen early nineteen eighties, uh, it was just basically uh, that's when the definition was formed for California. And I believe it, um, it was just that's what they felt at that time. And, and in looking at the state and the diversity of our state, um, you know, we already have twenty three hundred a third of our plants with this category of of uh, or, ele or definition of the element occurrence. And um, if we were to change that, we could easily add, you know, probably quite a few hundred more um, based on that. So I think just based on our diversity of the state and our natural, our, our um, we're biodiversity hotspot, that it's kind of nice to have that extra um, leeway and, and not, um, you know, rank everything in the state. So we can prioritize this way by the actual you know, higher imperiled plants. I'll ask a question. Um, it has to do with the, 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 the rare plant review form. So, yeah. so if, um, so I'll just get up there because then I can say it to Mike. Aaron, if I am a person who knows of a rare plant <laughs> and I want the, I would like it to be kind of considered for addition to or rank change in the inventory in a quick fashion, how might I do that? Yeah. <laughs> you. Well, I take uh, donations now. Just <laughs> no, never. Um, I do not be bribed. Uh, no, uh, it, basically the easiest way is to just contact me directly. Um, we have these these uh, documents that people can fill out and essentially um, begin the process themselves by reviewing um, the information and researching the plant. But from what I've found, it's actually more difficult because we have to fact check everything that they've submitted, so it ends up being a lot more work, and it's just doubling the time in a way. So the best way is to just give me a, a brief summary of why you think it is, and anyone you know uh, that may uh, know information, more information about it, and to, um, you know, if, if when we actually go through the process, I'll be contacting a lot more and asking uh, specific questions that I find, um, whether it's uh, about historical records and other things. Um, so that's the best way to, to go about it. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah.